chapter 10, beginning at verse 30, and we will read through verse number 48. The word of the Lord today reads, And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him, after he rose from the dead and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, meaning the Jews, which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. 
Amen. Bow your heads with me one more time. Master, Savior, Redeemer, soon coming King. How much we love you. How grateful we are, God, for the presence of a living Christ in the midst of his people today. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I feel his hands of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Oh, Master, we're so grateful for your presence in this place. We're grateful for the Word of God. We're grateful in advance for that message which you've laid upon the heart of your messenger. But Lord, I'm only a man, flesh and blood, full of sin and failure, incapable of being a blessing or a help to the people of God, except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. How I plead with you today, O oh God, to anoint me with your great Holy Ghost. Help me to deliver the Word of God in a fashion that will bring honor and glory to your wonderful name. Let the heart of every hearer be prepared by your Spirit to not only hear this Word, but to receive it gladly, that it might become engraved upon our hearts. And Lord, that it might take root as good seed upon good soil. And it might bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. O oh, Master, today, anoint, touch, heal, save, deliver, reclaim as the word of God goes forth. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Praise God. Amen. got to tell you today the thing that separates the Pentecostal movement and the spirit filled church from any other denomination or any other movement that calls itself Christian today is the spirit filled church believes that the same church that was established on the day of Pentecost is the identical same church that God will be looking for when he returns one wonderful resurrection morning. He did not fill people with the gift of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost so that we could read it as an event in history. No, God filled his people with his presence and his power on the day of Pentecost. And today, 2,000 years later, he is still filling his people with the gift of the Holy Ghost. He is still filling his people with his glory and his power. Hallelujah. He is still enabling the people of God to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost so that we might operate in the authority of Jesus' name. What does that mean? That means that we are Christ's ambassadors. When you're an ambassador to another country, you represent the country that you come from. When the United States sends an ambassador to uh, Egypt, or we send an ambassador to China, or we send an ambassador to Japan, that individual is in a foreign country. That is not their country. But the building that he occupies, the embassy, is considered sovereign ground. That property is considered to be part of 
the United States of America. Mm -hmm. When other nations send ambassadors to our country, the same is true of them. While the Japanese ambassador is living in the United States of America, that little piece of ground that surrounds his home, that surrounds the place that he operates from, the offices that he operates from, the embassy, that is considered sovereign ground in his part of the nation of Japan or whatever nation that individual comes from. The word of God said that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. We occupy today a foreign land. We occupy a place that is ruled by the flesh, that is ruled by an earthly, fleshly existence, mm -hmm. but we are citizens of heaven, and one day we look forward to going home. Hallelujah. But while we're here, we are ambassadors. We represent the nation from which we come. Right, yes. That's one reason why Christians live differently than non-Christians live. That's one reason why we follow a different code. That's why we embrace a different morality. That is why we believe in things like decency and kindness and compassion and charity because these are all things that are part of our heavenly home. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. And we are to represent, while we are here, not the land in which we live, but rather the land to which we belong. Hallelujah. We believe the Spirit-filled church is a reality in the world today. It is not merely something we read about in our Bibles in Acts the 10th chapter, we read how that God poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost on a group of Romans of all the people in the world. God poured the Holy Ghost out on the very people who crucified, physically crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, for their great sin, for their great offense toward heaven, they still, listen to me children, they still were not excluded from the promise of salvation. Hallelujah. Oh, for everything done by Rome, God still did not punish the Romans. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? No, he made salvation and the gift of the Holy Ghost available to them the same way he had made salvation through the gift of the Holy Ghost available to the Jewish people in Jerusalem. You'll notice in our primary text today that as Peter was preaching, he kept referring to the Jews, and he kept referring to the Jewish territories. You see, Peter was shocked that the Lord, by the Holy Ghost, had instructed him to go to the home of a Roman soldier and share with him the gospel. Peter was shocked. This was not something that he anticipated. And there were a number of Jewish believers who had gone with him to the home of Cornelius. And they all were wondering, why in the world would God send an angel to instruct Peter to come to the home of a Roman centurion to share 
the gospel. Why is, I don't understand why the Lord's doing this, but you know, it behooves us, even when we don't understand what God's doing or why He's doing it, it behooves us to do it. Hallelujah. Oh, I learned a long time ago, when the Holy Ghost speaks to you, honey, it's not time to stand there and argue with God. It's not time to try to reason things out. It's not time to try to understand things according to your understanding of things. It is time to obey the voice of the Lord. When I first came into the apostolic movement, uh, I was a full-blown, born and raised, you know, assembly of God boy, and I was moving to a new city. The Lord instructed me to move to this new city in East Texas. And I'm driving down the road and I passed a church, an apostolic church, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me just as clear as bell and said, that's where I want you to go to church. And I thought, well, Lord, that'd be well and good if I was somebody who believed that way. That'd be all fine and good if I was somebody who, you know, belonged to that denomination or to that movement. But I'm not. But the Lord said, that's where I want you to go to church. So Sunday came, my little brother who was living with me, and I got dressed, and we drove up to First United Pentecostal Church, and I pulled into the parking lot, and I walked through the door, and the pastor came over and introduced him to myself, Brother Davis, nice man, good man. And I shook his hand, and I said, well, are you ready for a new church member? And he looked at me, and boy, you could just see the shock on his face. How many people, I'm going to tell you, how many people walk into the church and say, I'm here, and I'm going to be here, and I'm going to stay here, and you ain't going to see me get offended and leave. You're not going to see me act like some little tinsel sissy and run out the door at the first word that offends me. No, sir, I'm here. Why? Because God told me to be here. I'm going to tell you something. I would be just as happy if not one single person ever walked through the door of this church, ever, except for those who had heard from the Lord first. I'd be thrilled to death if every person who ever stepped through the door of this church were somebody that God spoke to and said, I want you to be part of that church. Because I'm going to tell you something. If God speaks to you and tells you He wants you to be somewhere, you're, you'd be the biggest dummy on the planet to get up and leave for any reason. Listen to me now. Except God telling you, I want you to get up and leave. See, when the Lord tells you to do something, um, you don't have any business making any moves until He tells you to do otherwise. You understand what I'm telling you now? In other words, when the Lord told me to go to that church, I wasn't going to get offended at their doctrine. I wasn't going to get offended at something the preacher said. I wasn't going to... And there were a lot of things in that church. I'm going to tell you truthfully. There were a lot of things in that church I was not real happy with. There were a number of things. There were people there that were as demonic as anything I've ever laid my eyes on. Literally. Literally. I didn't go anywhere. I stayed right where, why did I stay there? I'll tell you why, because that's where God told me He wanted me to be. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes the Lord will put you places, and there are going to be things there you don't like. You're going to see things you don't like to see. You're going to hear things you don't like to hear. You're going to experience things you don't like to experience. But that is all part of the learning process. The Spirit of the Lord puts you there for a reason. And all those things that rub you wrong, all those things that get on your nerve, all those things you'd rather not have to put up with, that is iron sharpening iron. The Word of God said iron sharpens iron, doesn't it? Amen. In other words, if you're going to scrape off some of your rough edges, you got to deal with some rough stuff. Mm -hmm. You can't sharpen a sword with a smooth stone. No, it has to be a porous stone. 
It has to be a rough stone. Hallelujah. And sometimes what helps us to become better believers, what helps us to live our lives better, what helps us to learn patience and compassion and charity, are learning to deal with people who are otherwise difficult to deal with. But we got people in our world today, oh no, the first experience they have makes them a little bit uncomfortable and they're running for the door. The first person they meet, they don't like too well. They're running for the door. Yeah, you know why? Because you're somebody that has no interest in the universe in growing and maturing and becoming better. Oh my goodness, I don't know where that came from. Well, I know where it came from. I don't know who it's going out to, but I know where it came from. Peter was called to a place that he probably thought would be one of the last places in the world he'd ever be called to. The home of a Roman centurion. The angel of the Lord told him, God has spoken to this man and the Lord has instructed this man to send for you. Now your part of the bargain is you need to go and you need to share the gospel with this man and whoever else is in his home. And Peter obeyed the voice of God. He went to the home of Cornelius even though he may have been full of all kinds of trepidation and doubt and questioning. And there in the home of Cornelius, our primary text tells us how Cornelius spoke to him and explained to him how it is that he came to send for Peter. And then the word of the Lord says that Peter realized something. He said, well, you know, I, I realize now that God is no respecter of persons. Hallelujah. All oh, children, the reason today that this ministry of this church is LGBT affirming and LGBT inclusive is because God is no respecter of persons. Hallelujah. If you have a mind to do right. The Bible said, Peter spoke the words and said, but he, listen, I'm going to read it to you so I don't say it wrong. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of the truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Fearing God is not about being afraid of God. The word of the Lord tells us that God has not given us the spirit of fear. Got news for you. God has no interest in your being terrified of Him. God does not want you to be afraid of Him. That is not what fear means. When you fear authorities, when you fear uh, those in power, it simply means that you give them a place in your thinking. What does that mean? That means that when you are deciding and making decisions on how to act and how to live and how to conduct yourself, you think about these things. You think about these people. For instance, when you were a young person and you went out with friends and you were hanging out and all of a sudden your friends or some of their friends pulled out a substance that your parents had warned you about and told you to stay away from and they began to mess with drugs or they began to mess with alcohol or they began to engage in some activity that you had been taught 
and trained to understand was something that you ought not to do and you ought not to participate in. You feared your mom and dad. That didn't mean you were afraid your mom and dad were going to beat you dead when you got home because there was a good possibility they would never know that you even engaged in this. But you still feared your parents, meaning you gave your parents a place in your thinking. What did you do? You thought about your upbringing. You thought about how you were raised. You thought about how you had been trained. And the things that you had been taught from your youth came to mind because you feared your parents. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Mm -hmm. And you said, I need to go home. I'm going to get away from this. I don't want to be around this. Amen. Right? You're not fearing your parents in the sense of being terrified, but you're giving them a place in your thinking. That's what the term fear God means. Cornelius was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. The Romans served any number of deities, any number of gods. But somewhere in Cornelius' mind, he had heard the message of the Jewish people that there was not but one God. See, the Jews were the only race running around preaching the concept of one God. And somewhere in Cornelius' heart, he embraced that notion that there was one supreme deity. And the Word of God tells us that he prayed. But he wasn't praying to Neptune. He wasn't praying to one of the many Roman gods. No, apparently he was talking to the God of the Jewish people. And the God of the Jewish people <laughs> answered him back. And let him know, I've got a message you need to hear. And what I want you to do is send for this fellow at this address and he'll come and he'll tell you what you need to hear. Cornelius explains this to Peter. Peter comes. Peter said, well, I, just by reason of the Lord telling me to be here, I've come to realize that God is not a respecter of persons. Anybody who gives him a place in their thinking Listen to me, children. And who worketh righteousness. Listen, listen, listen. This is important. He did not say who is righteous. He said who worketh righteousness is accepted with him. What does working righteousness mean? That means righteousness defined simply is doing right. That's all the word righteous means. Doing right. So someone who works righteousness is someone who not only knows how to do right, but they strive to do right. You hear me now? Cornelius was known for being a charitable, charitable man. When the Lord spoke to Cornelius and said, uh, when the angel spoke to him and said, the Lord has heard your prayer and he recognizes your alms. That literally means that God has paid attention to your charitableness. He has seen you give to the poor. He has seen you try to do right by others. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I'm going to tell you a little secret, folks. LGBT people can fear God. LGBT right. people can work righteousness. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, and in every nation, among every group of people on this planet, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Hallelujah. <coughs> Peter begins to share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, I know y'all have heard this message. I know you've heard it because it's already been published all over. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. He said, it's already been published all over the Jewish world. Well, of course, the Romans were living in Israel. 
they had occupied and colonized Canaan, the land of Israel. So Peter is saying, you're living in our country. And this message which came to the Jews... You'll notice when you read what Peter said, he's always emphasizing the Jewishness of the situation. He said, God sent this message to the Jews. God testified that the prophecies God had given through the Jews was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And I know you've heard this message because it's been preached all through the land of the Jews. He still got it in his head that this gospel was sent to the Jews, through the Jews, for the Jews. But then God is only God can do. <laughs> God steps in with an act of God and he pours the Holy Ghost out on the house of Cornelius while Peter was still speaking. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, the, the, the people who had gathered in Cornelius' house, all of a sudden, they begin to manifest and demonstrate that they too had received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, says... For they heard them speak with other tongues. How did Peter and the others, the Jews that came with him, how did they know that Cornelius received the gift of the Holy Ghost? The same way I know today that somebody's received the gift of the Holy Ghost. You hear them speak with other tongues. You hear them begin to bless the Lord and magnify the Lord and worship the Lord in a language they have never learned and a language they do not know. But that mechanism is turned on by the Holy Ghost in their spirit and all of a sudden, just as naturally as speaking your native language, you're speaking praise and worship and oftentimes it happens, people don't even realize they're speaking in another tongue. They don't even realize they're speaking in another language because literally it just pours out of you as naturally as breathing and all of a sudden you're standing there bum, 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 talking in another language and you don't even realize it's happening sometimes God poured the Holy Ghost out on a bunch of Romans now wait a minute <laughs> I had a hard enough time understanding why he would send us here to begin with but now now God is showing us that not only does he recognize people that fear him and people who try to do right, but they also are, excuse me, let me rephrase that. They also have access to his salvation. They also have access to this gospel. That blew their minds. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. But what they were seeing, listen to me children, what they were seeing was an act of God. It wasn't an act of nature. How often in nature do you see a chicken suddenly start to move like a cow? How often in nature do you see a Turtles start to bray like a horse. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? How often in nature does a human being simply begin naturally to speak another language, a language which they do not know, a language which they have not learned? How often does this occur in nature? It doesn't. And therefore, when the Jews saw this happen. They knew it had to be God. Mm -hmm. Oh my Lord. Oh my Lord. There are those times when that which occurs can be explained by no other means than simply describing it as an act of God. It's not an act of man nor is it an act of nature. 
but it is an undeniable act of the Almighty. The Holy Ghost baptism is evidenced physically by the spontaneous utterance of praise and worship in another language as made possible by the indwelling Holy Spirit. This is an undeniable act of God. All of a sudden, an act of God made Peter and the Jews who had come with him to the house of Cornelius have to rethink, listen to me, have to rethink their whole theology. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, an act of God. See, when God does something and it is undeniably God who is doing it, then you have no option but to rethink what you thought you knew. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I'm going to say that again. When God does something that clearly is an act of God and cannot be described in any other way, cannot be described as an act of man, cannot be described as an act of nature, cannot be described in scientific terms. When God does something, when there is an act of God that clearly can be defined as nothing more and nothing less than an act of God, we suddenly have to rethink our theology. Everything we think we know about God, we need to rethink. Why? Well, God's just done something that undeniably had to be Him doing it. So now, why would He do that? Why, you know, what? I thought this thing was for the Jews and the Jews only. I didn't think the gospel included the Gentile world. But now all of a sudden there's a bunch of Gentiles speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. They've clearly received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I need to rethink things. I need to think this thing over. Oh, children, I'm here to tell you today, God wants to do something in the LGBT world that is going to blow the mind of God the church. God wants to do something with and in and through LGBT people that is going to force the church to reconsider what it thought it knew about grace. Hallelujah! God is wanting to do something. Thank God I'm part of the Spirit-filled church because as part of the Spirit church, I know that God is still moving and God is still acting and God is still speaking even in the 21st century. He has not stopped speaking. He has not stopped moving. He has not stopped acting. Yes. Hallelujah. He is the same God we read about in the book of Acts. And his church looks just like the church described in the book of Acts. Oh my Lord, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means when God needs to make a point, listen to me, He doesn't need you or I to make it for Him. See, there's a lot of so-called Christians out there in the world today, and they think the only way that God can speak today is through them. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Mr. Baptist, I'm sorry. I'm going to pick on you for a minute. But you're convinced that God doesn't act like He acted in the book of Acts. God doesn't talk like He talked in the book of Acts. God doesn't move like He moved in the book of Acts. Therefore, if God has something to say, then I have to say it for Him. Wrong. 
And when God pours out a revival in the LGBT community, when you see LGBT people by the hundreds receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost all over this country and speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance, empowering them by the Holy Ghost, honey, when you see that happening, all of a sudden over there at First Pentecostal Church, all of a sudden over there at St. And UPC church all of a sudden over there at the assembly of God and the church of God they're suddenly going to have to rethink their theology uh -huh. why? because of something I said because of something I preached no, because of an act of God hallelujah well I want to tell you I, I had to go recently to the city here in Decatur to get a certificate of occupancy for this space that we're in right now. While I was there, I met a Hispanic lady. She was there doing something, I'm not sure what, but she told me, she said, our neighbor's tree was blown over by the storm that came through the other day. She said it fell right on our house. <laughs> and I said, oh my word. She said, and the neighbor won't do a thing in the world to help us clean it up. She, he won't help us cut it, uh, cut it up and, you know, dispose of it. He won't contribute anything. She said, and I talked to him about it. And he said, well, by law, I don't have to. She said, well, I called my homeowner's insurance and talked to them. And you know what they told me? They told me that he was right. Even though it was his tree. Even though it was the tree that stood for probably a hundred years in his yard on his property. He is under no obligation whatsoever to help clean it up and get it off of my property and get it off of my house. She said, I asked the, I asked the insurance person, well, how in the world can he hold no responsibility? How can he have no responsibility? That just doesn't even begin to make any sense. And the insurance lady said, well, by law, it's considered an act of God. Oh, so because it's an act of God, it had, wasn't any negligence on his part or anything. Because it's considered an act of God, then it's all well and good that he just let me have to deal with the cleanup. And the insurance lady said, yep, that's how it works. Got news for you, honey. That was not an act of God. The insurance can call it an act of God. The law can call it an act of God. But that's the kind of foolishness we see happening in the church today. That was not an act of God. That was an act of nature. Mm -hmm. God had nothing to do with blowing that tree over into that lady's yard. Nature had to do with blowing that tree into the yard. Oh, but sometimes when we want to explain something away so we can evade responsibility. Sometimes when we want to explain something away so that we don't have to be responsible for it. Suddenly we describe it as an act of God. Some so-called, <coughs> excuse me, some Christians love to point to an act of man or an occurrence of nature and label it the act of God. TV preacher Pat Robertson, for instance, has become infamous for declaring natural disasters as acts of God. When they occur somewhere, he can correlate with some perceived evil or wickedness. Mm -hmm. We know the reputation that a certain city in Louisiana has. We know that it has a reputation for all kinds of sin and all kinds of debauchery. So when 
a massive hurricane comes through and drowns that city with water and destroys hundreds of homes and businesses. How convenient it is for the preacher to suddenly get up and say, See, this was an act of God. What's the name of that city? New Orleans. New Orleans. This was God's judgment upon New Orleans. No, it wasn't. It was an act of nature. It was not an act of God. Oh, when Donald Trump's in office, the most evil, wicked, ungodly, demonic, foul human being I've ever witnessed with my eyes in my 57 years of life, and Christians are falling at his altar to worship him. I never saw more natural disasters occur in this country, have you, than the four years that man was in office. Every time you turned around, something horrible was happening in America while that man was in office. I didn't get up in the pulpit and say, this is an act of God. God is pronouncing judgment on America because we elected Donald Trump. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Isn't it funny when tornadoes tore through the middle of the Bible Belt and destroyed hundreds and even thousands of homes, left many, many, many Christians homeless, destitute, ruined, their businesses ruined, their homes destroyed. Where was Pat Robertson then? Why did we not hear that somehow, some way, this was an act of God? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's easy to call something an act of God when in fact it's not God. It can be explained in another way. Am I telling the truth? It can be explained. A gunman goes in to a gay bar in Florida and kills dozens of people and you've got preachers saying, this was an act of God. No, it was not. That was an act of man. That was a deranged lunatic. That was someone who had lost touch with reality, who went in and murdered dozens of human beings because he didn't understand them, or he didn't like them, or he was afraid of them. That's not an act of God, that's an act of man. When a storm comes through and destroys hundreds of homes and businesses and leaves thousands out in the cold, it is not an act of God, it is an act of nature. We've got to be careful about what we label an act of God. But again, I want to repeat, when God fills someone with the Holy Ghost, and they begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. What other explanation can there be but that this is an act of God? It's not nature. Hello now. Do you understand what I'm telling you? And when God performs a sovereign act, all of a sudden His people are placed in a position where they have to rethink what they thought they knew. Well, I've got news for you today, folks. God has sent us to northern Alabama because He wants to perform a miraculous work in this city, in this region, in this state, so that those who call themselves Spirit-filled believers can be challenged to rethink what they think they know. In Genesis 19, we read of an act of God which resulted in the destruction of two great cities. There were actually more than two cities, but the Word of God usually kind of truncates that event by referring to the two major cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now listen carefully, don't jump ahead of me, folks. We read of an act of God in Genesis 19. 
That act of God occurred in response to their idolatry and their excess. We know for certain that this event was an act of God as the scriptures clearly tell us, listen, in Ezekiel 16, 48 through 51, As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, listen, I took them away as I saw good. So God clearly states that the events concerning the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah were at his hand. But listen to verse 51. Neither hath Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations, thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. The Lord is speaking to the nation of Israel through the prophet Ezekiel and he is saying to the nation of Israel your conduct has been far far worse than that of Sodom. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? He said, your conduct has been far worse than that of Sodom. He said, now let me tell you what the sins of Sodom were. And he then goes on to clearly articulate what the sins of Sodom were. And funny enough, homosexuality is not on this list. This is God speaking. This is God explaining why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. He said, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. She did not strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abomination. The word abomination always, always has a relationship to idolatrous practice. Mm -hmm. The sexual activity that we read about in Sodom was associated with idolatrous practice. But you'll notice the Lord doesn't reference the sexual activity. He references what? The abomination, which is what? Related to idolatry. So he, in essence, is speaking of the idolatry and not the acts associated with the, the idolatry. This is an example of God personally taking credit for that which he has done himself. Now there's an example, for instance, of prophecy that is often specifically attributed to the Lord's doing, yet it is not specifically attributed to the Lord Himself, and that is found in Mark 13. A lot of times you'll hear preachers preach and they'll read certain prophecies concerning the last days, and they'll say, well, God's going to do this, and God's going to do that, no. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. It says that as we draw closer to the end, you will see these things happen. That does not mean that God is doing those things. It right. just means that for whatever reason, these things will be happening. 
in Mark chapter 13, verses 4 through 9, as an example. Tell us what, excuse me, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be. But the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. Nowhere does he say God is doing any of this. Mm -hmm. He simply says there shall be. These things will be happening. But he is not saying that God himself will be performing these things. The truth is that many of the prophecies of Scripture are not even directly associated with an act of God. The Bible often foretells of events without saying that those events it is foretelling will be caused by God Himself. No, the Word of God tells us of things to come, but not things which God Himself is one day to do, but rather things which simply are one day to come to pass. For whatever reason, and in response to any number of causes, but then there are those prophecies which directly and specifically speak of that which the Lord Himself is going to do. Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, this is on the day of Pentecost, immediately following the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the upper room, as the apostles and disciples of the Lord spilled out into the streets, speaking with other tongues, magnifying God, praising God in a variety of languages that they did not know and that they had never learned, but they were now quickened by the Holy Ghost to speak. And Peter says, Be this known unto you and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, listen, I will. So we know God himself is doing this. What is he doing? I will pour out storms upon sinful cities. I will destroy the wicked through natural disasters. No. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants, and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Oh my goodness. God himself has promised that he will himself pour out of his spirit upon all flesh in the last days. Hallelujah. This prophecy makes it abundantly clear that this prophecy is specifically 
and clearly speaking of an act of God. Hallelujah. The Lord wants to do something wonderful in the church as we approach the end of this age. One of the things he wants to do is restore to the people of God universal an understanding of grace. Like the people of Israel in the Lord's day, the church has become wrongly convinced that the law and works are essential to salvation. Mm -hmm. And they have convinced themselves that God's grace is not sufficient for our entire journey from conversion to redemption. But the promise of prophecy is that the Lord will send a mighty move of God in the last days that will affect and include, listen, all of humanity. It will not be limited to those who do things a certain way, but rather will be manifested by an act of God which will identify them those who belong to Him. Oh, hallelujah. I hope you're hearing me today. He said, I will pour out of my Spirit in those days. He said, your sons and daughters are going to prophesy, but listen, 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 listen. Oh, I wish people would listen and read and understand the Word of God because God is so careful about the way He works things. He says, and on my handmaids and on my servants will I pour out of my spirit in those days. <laughs> oh my goodness, so what does that tell you? That tells you that when this move of God comes, whoever is affected by it, oh my Lord, God identifies as His. Glory of God. God identifies as His handmaid. God identifies as His servant. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my Lord. I'm going to tell you something. I'm trying to close. I know I'm going a little bit long today. It's hard for me to preach folks to, to an audienceless room. It's very difficult. It would be a whole lot easier if we had people that could come and be with us. <clears throat> I want you to understand today I started my affirming ministry 30 years ago I began in New York City because I had been living in New York City and when the Lord finally brought me back into the church and brought me back into communion with Him uh I was living in New York. I needed a church, and my partner at the time and I wanted a church, and we couldn't just go to any Pentecostal Spirit-filled church, so uh, ultimately I wound up starting a ministry there in the city. And in the beginning, we had meetings at the uh, LGBT Community Center on 13th Street in Manhattan uh, on, in the uh, West Village. We had services in that building, the Gay Lesbian Community Services Center. In that building, we had services that mirrored outpourings of the Holy Ghost that I experienced when I was part of Riverside Church of God. We had services in that building surrounded by LGBT people belonging to any number of different groups and organizations and, and many people came into that building to participate in all types of organizations and activities. We were in just one rented room and the Spirit of the Lord fell in that room. And we had mighty, mighty outpourings of the Holy Ghost in that building. One lady was invited by friends of hers who were part of the LGBT community. And she was a ordained minister 
in one of the largest Pentecostal denominations in the world. But she knew these men. And they told her about our church. And they said, you got to come see this. you got to come check this out. And I imagine she was a lot like Peter. What? LGBT people? They have their services at the LGBT community center. Why in the world would I go there? Why in the world would I want to be there? But they invited her to come and she decided, I'm going to check this out. She came. And that particular Sunday we had a good crowd. And we had a marvelous service. Oh my goodness, how the Holy Ghost moved. We had such a move of God. It was, it was the most, one of the most wonderful services that I've been part of in the 30 years I've been in affirming ministry. And after the service, this lady came up to me and she gave me a big hug. And she said, I've got to tell you something. She said, I got to tell you something. She said, I didn't know what I was going to see today. I didn't know what to expect, what I was going to experience. She said, but honey, the Holy Ghost was here like I had never seen the Holy Ghost anywhere. She said, my God, the power of God was in this place. The Spirit of the Lord was here. She said, oh, I could feel the Spirit of God like I have never felt the Spirit of God. She said, if somebody were to walk into your church and they did not know in advance that you were uh, an affirming work, she said, they would probably simply look at it and say, wow, this is an old-fashioned, Holy Ghost-filled church. She said, because that's what you feel. That's what you experience. This is just a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost-filled church. I'm going to tell you something, folks. When you quit trying to convince people of things on your own strength and through your own effort, and you let God be God, mm -hmm. and Amen. let God do it, Yes. God can say things through an act of God that you and I could never say. Amen. And it will be heard. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you today, God is wanting to do something right here in Alabama. And He's wanting to do it through an act of God. He is wanting to pour His Spirit out upon all flesh. He's wanting to identify his sons and his daughters, his servants and his handmaidens. In our primary text today, the Lord spoke through his own actions and declared that all who will believe and embrace his gospel have access to the church and all the benefits derived through faith in this gospel. The Holy Ghost baptism was not withheld from the Romans simply because they were not believing Jews. This is what the Jewish early church members believed. But through an act of God, the Lord made clear that their beliefs were wrong. So it is today, as the promise of the last day pouring out of God's Spirit is realized, the Lord will speak through an act of God alone and declare that all flesh has access to the salvation afforded humanity through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. Don't miss out on heaven because of the acts of men. Get on board. Believe the promises of God. And let's let an act of God speak to a faltering and falsely believing church that you too are able to drink into the same spirit and partake of the same salvation afforded all those who will believe, embrace, and obey this glorious gospel.
Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen. Yes. 